Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa has once again descended into a period of unstable electricity supply. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss how we got here and the likely outlook for 2015. Hi Terence. Hi. The break in the power supply started around November, early November. How did we get to this point once again after a period of relative stability in the power supply? That's correct. I think that relative stability was really hiding a lot of uh, difficulties that were always there. And I think it also was, the, was meant that the pain was mostly being borne by the industrial sector. So the big energy consumers were actually were facing load shedding, had cut the, uh, their consumption. So we were in a very tight uh, situation. But what pushed us right over the edge and where we now are sharing the pain across into households and into commercial enterprises is the Majuba coal silo collapse <coughs> on November the 1st. And uh, that's a fairly new power station in the Eskom system. It's actually the newest, other than the two that are being built uh, currently at Madupi and Kusile. So it was, uh, it was supposed to be uh, operating at a fairly high level. So the fact that that silo went down, there was no redundancy on the coal supply front, which meant that basically the power station went down, was what tipped us from November the 1st over the edge. And then subsequently, We've had a number of other uh, failures in the system, most notably around diesel supply, and uh, that's that's becoming more and more of an issue as we go into the, the into the future. And then you've got the energy availability factor out of the coal-fired power stations, having fallen from 90% type levels in the 1990s all the way down to now we're here at around 72% currently. So that means basically we have a nameplate of 40,000, 42,000. Uh, megawatts in the system, but even though we're only consuming around 30,000 megawatts at the moment every day, maybe even, probably even less, we aren't able to keep the lights on, which means there's a lot of plant unavailable. So the, uh, we've got a lot of unplanned outages um, and we've got maintenance that's been protracted, so you expect a unit that's been out on long-term maintenance to come back on a certain date. When they try to bring those units back on, they find that their other problems arise and then they have to keep that plant down for longer. So that becomes an unplanned event. And then you've also got the scheduled maintenance, which Eskom is committed to uh, to doing. And if you look back as to why we've got here, there's really a, a number of failures, but there was primarily a policy failure where we said Eskom wouldn't build anymore. It would be the private sector, but we didn't align that policy with a price path that allowed the private sector to come in. So the private sector couldn't come into an environment where they were going to make a loss on uh, producing electricity. And then when we realized that they weren't going to come in, uh, Eskom was given the mandate to build, that uh, they, were, they had to rush through the designs. They went ahead with building projects which weren't properly funded. There was no funding plan for them. We didn't have the skills. We went for very mega projects. And now we have projects that are m massively over time and massively over budget. And until those projects come on, I think we're going to be in a period of uh, tightness and instability. And the prognosis for early 2015 is also concerning. It's very concerning and it comes this now down to the diesel issue. Now, in uh, last year, which is the 2013-14 financial year for Eskom, they spent over 10 billion rand on uh, buying diesel and burnt uh, that diesel in the open cycle gas turbines down in the Western Cape and that really kept the lights on. They're saying that they're going to be spending a similar amount this year and uh, this is well ahead of what they've been allocated by, uh, for diesel uh, by the regulator. I think it's closer to the two and a half billion type level that's really been allocated in the MIPD3, which is the current tariff path. Um, and so basically they're spending a lot more on diesel. They, we consume, these OCGTs are consuming at a far higher rate than they were expected to. They're designed to really be peaking plant, which is really for three hours, maybe four hours a day. They are now being used up to 10, 12 hours a day just to keep the lights on. And what we can see now is as we come into the end of December, it will be things will stabilize somewhat, although there is a risk this week of load shedding. Because industry, there's a lot of shutdowns amongst industries, so there'll be lower demand and there'll be more space for Eskom. And they have built up reserves of both in terms of the peaking hydro plants and the diesel. So we should be able to get through uh, this month and probably a lot of January is the prognosis. But from February onwards, it's going to get uh, very, very difficult because Eskom basically doesn't have the cash flow 
to, uh, to fund the acquisition of additional diesel or at the rate that we're currently burning it. So this, as the CEO to Diesel Matona suggests, requires a national conversation. And that national conversation seems to be coming into some sharp relief now with the cabinet statement of this week saying that um, there's going to be a request to ESCOM to come up with this cash flow scenario and for uh, that to be delivered this year to government. And for that, uh, there, there seems to be a willingness on the side of government to find some way of funding um, both what will be the, mostly the, the diesel as well as extending the short-term power purchase agreements with a number of IPPs and co-generators that are currently in the mix. So the prognosis for uh, the end of summer, so from February and March, is very, very bad. Uh, unless we can find these, uh, some money for the diesel, some money for the RPPs, and but particularly and uh, is, is we can get that energy availability factor above the 72% and above the 80% and going back towards the target, which is 85%. Because if we got back there, we wouldn't have to use as much diesel. We could use them as peaking plants. And we, you know, we really wouldn't be as tight. We wouldn't be facing the risk. But we, we, we need some action on that front. And hopefully with, uh, um, there's going to be a lot more action around the maintenance. And hopefully the quality of maintenance improves so that the prognosis for uh, February and March is better than it currently looks. And what needs to happen so that we get, um, well, you've discussed what we need to do to get through the crisis, but to get to a point where we are stable once again, where we have supply security? Well, I think it comes down to getting Madupi and Kusile working, and that's going to take some time. So we'll see the synchronization of the Madupi Unit 6 quite soon now. Probably, what one, I don't think it's going to be in 2014. I think it's going to be early 2015. But that is just one milestone in a commissioning process. And the key real milestone is when that plant is operating commercially. And, and the date set for that is only middle of next year, between March and June. So we're some way off getting that 800 megawatts. Then the attention has to turn to the intervals uh, between the units. So how long is it going to take between Unit 6 and Unit 5 before that Unit 5 is operating? When will Unit 1 at Kosile come up? And what will the intervals for the subsequent units be? So I think that's very, very important to get that going. The cabinet statement today re-emphasized the role of the private sector, um, looking at short-term co-generation projects, uh, coal base load up, uh, from the IPPs. Now those are going to involve procurement processes. Those procurement processes have not kicked off yet. They should start, uh, the, the, the commitment made was early next year, the January date was given. Uh, whether they stick to that we'll have to see. But then you have a bidding process, then you have to get to a period of financial closure. So I don't think we're going to get to financial close before the end of next year. Then we only go for construction. So cogeneration might be fairly quick uh, relatively, but the coal base load will take some time. So those aren't immediate remedies. But in the very long term, we look to have to look at the energy supply industry and what role Eskin is going to play, what role the RPPs are going to play whether it's appropriate to have the grid company inside embedded in Eskom or whether it needs to be outside of that. How are we going to manage that relationship if it remains within uh, Eskom because it does mean player and referee type scenarios coming up and it, that does lower the appetite from the private sector to invest. So we need to look at the structure of this industry and we need to do this probably sooner rather than later. But I don't think it's the immediate priority. I think to go und undertake a massive restructuring exercise of the industry while we've got so many crisis balls in the air is probably not wise. But we do need to start that, that process and uh, put some urgency behind it because we can't have another five point plan which basically re regurgitates plans that we've had back since 2011, 2010 um, and then stating them at the end of 2014 in the same way with the restructuring of the industry. Let's get this process going. Let's have the conversation to look at the long term while we're also dealing with these immediate crisis issues. Thanks, Terence. That is the second Take Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.